LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is David Feidler, who joins us to discuss his book, Restoring the Soul of the World. For millennia, the world was seen as a creative, interconnected web of life in which we participated deeply. But when the world came to be described as a lifeless clock-like mechanism during the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries, life and intelligence came to be seen as existing only in human beings, and nature came to be increasingly viewed as an object of exploitation that primarily exists to meet human needs. This also led to a profound sense of alienation, since human beings no longer had any real bond with the world. In Restoring the Soul of the World, Feidler throws light on the unexamined connections between science, religion and culture, and how our deepest worldviews have influenced the ways we relate to the world, other people and our innermost selves. The book traces the ancient vision of living nature along its entire course, from its roots in the world soul of the great philosophers, to its eclipse during the scientific revolution, and its return today. Drawing upon the most important scientific discoveries of recent times, Restoring the Soul of the World shows how the mechanistic worldview has broken down, and presents a new vision of living nature and our own intrinsic bond with the deepest structures of the cosmic pattern. By learning from and collaborating with nature's intelligence, we can bring the world to fruition by viewing nature as a teacher and creative partner and help to regenerate the Earth's living systems. Hello and welcome, David, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, it's great to be with you. Now, today, David, we're going to talk a little bit about your new book uh, entitled Restoring the Soul of the World. Uh, Subtitle is Our Living Bond with Nature's Intelligence. Before we dive into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your background and... uh, how you came to be interested in these subjects, where the book came from, what the development of that was. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> if you go back a long time in my life, uh, I studied uh, ancient religions and philosophies at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, basically Greek philosophy and Greek religions. And um, I was very interested in the uh, Platonic you know, tradition, among other things, including the Pythagoreans. And as I, as I grew older, I became very interested in the study of worldview and cosmology and how our worldviews or cosmovisions uh, affect the way that we relate to other people and to the world itself. And I began reading more and more about the scientific revolution and the emergence of the mechanistic worldview, uh, whereas the worldview from ancient Greece was that the world was actually alive and ensouled in some way. And we could talk a little bit more later, you know, about what the Greeks um, meant by that. But uh, I became uh, quite convinced that this was a very, very important topic because really all of our uh, ecological and environmental problems come from this mechanistic view of the world that the world itself is just an object uh, dead matter in motion. It's not really something that's uh, alive in any profound sort of a way. So what I decided to do was to write this book that looked at the entire uh, trajectory of the Western tradition against the backdrop of this one idea of, of living nature from the ancient Greeks up into present times, and basically uh, how it's a significant idea in, in terms of you know, where we're headed you know, culturally and as a planet. This is a legacy, basically, of the Industrial Age, isn't it? This tremendous sense of alienation that we feel uh, in the the modern era uh, with regard to our sense of ourselves and our relationship to 
nature and you know the entire planet and indeed the cosmos and it's um it's a relatively new thing as in fact as you trace out in the book uh yes and in fact uh the roots of the industrial revolution go back uh, a bit earlier to uh the scientific revolution which is something that i spend a lot of time discussing in the book in terms of you know how did this idea of a uh, mechanistic worldview arise but uh you're absolutely right it it's something that has a profound effect upon us today and you can you can see this just in the way that we speak about the natural world for example the common term that we use for nature is the environment which is a totally sterile uh, you know academic sounding term and it it seems that we're not even part of the world at all but somehow we've been we've miraculously arrived in this sort of like uh uh sterilized clinical space that we call the environment. <laughs> so it it's and and that's the thing that's very interesting about world view because uh most world views are actually unconscious. Uh you know maybe like 80 to 90% of of our world view is unconscious and it's always been that way people just take uh their view of the world for granted as something that comes from society and uh so uh it's very difficult for some people to actually even you know go down the path of thinking about their world view because it's something that's so close to them you know it's like the water that fish swim in the you're right to to pin this back earlier than just the industrial uh, revolution for example as you mentioned the sort of the scientific age the dawn of and the renaissance and i suppose the irony there was that that movement in general was supposedly all about reason and logic and progress and it was to finally banish the the unscientific, woolly thinking of uh, of you know medieval times and the dark ages and what have you, and lead us into this modern age. But and of course, the good things came out of uh, these ideas and these movements. But there were a couple of key points where things profoundly changed, and that had an effect on everything else. And that's what's fed through to how we see ourselves now in relation to everything else that is. So it's not that the Renaissance, for example, was was a, a terrible development or what have you, but it's just that there, there's a couple of, maybe you can identify a couple of moments when it was just like that, that changed everything. And quite often it was just one person's idea, just one person's way of thinking that filtered out into everything else. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the Renaissance was very complex and... Uh, in, in one sense, uh, the Renaissance was a discovery, a rediscovery of this idea of, of living nature in, in the Florentine Renaissance, for example. And, and, uh, at that point, the idea of living nature and our living relationship to the world, uh, once a bit, once again became a, a very, uh, normative worldview. But there were, there were these other strands in Renaissance thinking, uh, and one of those strands was the mechanistic tradition, which actually you can trace all the way back to the Greeks and through medieval times and things like that. But it wasn't really the predominant way of of looking at, at the world. But there were uh, certain thinkers associated with uh, the scientific revolution who really uh, hammered this idea of a mechanical universe home. And um, what, I, what I'd like to do is just mention briefly what Plato said about the universe, uh, he described the world as a single living creature that contains all living creatures within it. And he described it as one whole of whole. So you have this idea of basically a philosophical holism that uh, the world consists of holes and that they're organically interrelated uh, as the parts of an organism. And that's really one of the main ideas behind uh living nature. And then if you flash forward uh, basically 2,000 years to Descartes, uh, Descartes described the universe as, as a machine. And uh, he said that, uh, I have described this earth and indeed the whole visible world as a machine. So you can see how totally opposite, you know, those two views are. They represent the, the opposite ends of, of a spectrum. And, uh, so Descartes was working, what, in the, basically the, the 1600s when, when the mechanistic worldview started to really, uh, you know, take over. And, uh, with, uh, Descartes' worldview, the world 
and our bodies became machines and uh, human beings no longer then had a real place in nature. We just became spectators, uh, disembodied uh, intellects. And the image of God at the time was uh, the God idea of deism, which was just a rational intellect that uh, sort of like drew up a plan for the universe and set the universe in motion and then stepped back and had no uh, direct relationship with the world after that. It was just a disembodied spectator. And it's very interesting to view the changing view of the human self at the time to really uh, you know, mirror that image of the God of deism. But basically, Descartes said that uh, everything in the uh, physical universe operated as a machine and that uh, animals, the bodies of animals were machines. And for example, if you, if you hit a dog and the dog barked, it wasn't a symptom of pain. It was, it was actually a sound given off by a malfunctioning machine. Yeah. I've often wondered fundamentally what changed. Was it something in the sort of collective subconscious or unconscious when it came to, you know, taking this hard materialistic view of the world? Um, at what point did, did leading thinkers and people who shaped society look back on what, however much history they were aware of, but certainly hundreds, thousands of years of human history with this different relationship, this sort of c- connected relationship to nature and, you know, to um, the rest of the planet and think that's really quaint and actually quite irrational. We need to kick it out. I, I, it doesn't seem to, I just wonder what changed at what point they thought, well, actually, yes, if we cut ourselves off from this yes. and start, start treating nature as a, um, as a, just a resource to be exploited and a, and a dumping ground ultimately. It seems odd looking at it now, but again, that's... Well, um, you know, uh, actually, um, you know, all of these, all of these ideas about the, the rise of the mechanistic worldview have been pretty well documented and they really are part of, of, of mainstream thought. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, you know, people will interpret them, you know, in different ways. And one of the things that I try to show in the book that's very interesting is that the scientific revolution had this mechanistic view of the world, which culminated with uh, the celestial mechanics of Newton. But uh, since then, over the past century or so, everything, uh, all, all of the fundamental premises of the mechanistic worldview have actually been disproven by uh new scientific discoveries, which is something that I also explore in the book. But to go back to your question, uh, what was it really that happened at that time that uh, uh, triggered uh, this very large shift in the way that people saw the world? Uh, well, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, new scientific discoveries that happened. There were some astronomical phenomena that uh, appeared that uh, undermined the ideas of, of Aristotle. So uh, thinkers, uh, scientific thinkers started thinking that we can't really rely upon, you know, these ancient thinkers as much as we did in the past because they weren't really looking at nature in, uh, an observational way or a, <clears throat> uh, experimental way. They were looking, uh, they were basically using the tools of, of logic to arrive at conclusions. And so one of the elements of the birth of modern science was the birth of the experimental method. But there was something much deeper happening, and I think uh, it was really a, a kind of a shift in uh, the quality of, of uh, human consciousness because uh, with the mechanistic worldview, there was actually this new vision of the human self that emerged at the same time. And one, one of the really... Uh, curious uh, things about uh, the history of ideas and the history of, of, of culture is that if you if you look at the uh, development of, of consciousness and the, the way that people look at the world uh, historically, it actually uh, seems to mirror in some uh, unusual sense the actual development of the human individual and we and uh, individually, when we reach a certain age, we start to develop, uh, you know, a, a well-defined ego. 
consciousness. And it seemed that that sort of shift was actually happening then. There was some kind of uh, shift in consciousness in the collective sense that really allowed these uh, different individuals to come up with this uh, new world view that was based on mathematics and, and which was also highly successful. Uh, when, when Newton uh, was able to work out the laws of celestial mechanics, he felt that he had, you know, looked into the mind of God and uh, people felt that there was some sort of, uh, you know, revelation at hand that we were finally able to, you know, unlock the secrets of nature. It's interesting in the early part of your book, we are tracing some of the developments of, you know, the sense of self and ego and evolution of human consciousness over time. We can look back and see how science, religion, philosophy were never really separate at all. And that was just something, you know, an illusion that we labored under for a relatively short space of time and has been coming undone probably in the last hundred years or so. And uh, one of the little ironies here is that uh, you mentioned Newton, but a lot of these pioneering scientists of that era, you know, were, were, you know, were Christians, thought they, that they were coming from a religious perspective. And yes. um, that, that's something certainly that I, I find is, uh, is rarely mentioned when people are discussing science today. Yes. In fact, uh, that's actually a very, very uh, crucial fact. And, and I agree with you that it's something that's, that's overlooked because um, you can raise the question, why is it that physics and experimental science arose, uh, you know, in Western Europe and did not arise anywhere else in, in the world in, in the sense of like mathematical physics and things like that? And, um, the reason for that, I think that there, there is actually an answer. The reason for that is that, um, uh, the scientific worldview actually ar arose out of uh, Christian theology because uh, in the Christian theological tradition, you have this idea that, that God is the lawmaker and, uh, that there are these laws of nature that were, you know, at least metaphorically instituted by God. And without that underlying idea, uh, the idea of the laws of physics would never have arisen. So that goes back to Newton's uh, line, uh, you know, oh God, I think thy thoughts after me. He really did feel that he was looking into the, the mind of God and that he had, uh, you know, decoded the mathematical blueprint that, that God had used in terms of constructing the universe. And you can take this analysis even further and say that our modern sense of, or, or the modern myth of progress also came from the Christian theological tradition, which then uh, became interpreted in a secular way. Uh, you see this in the, the work of Francis uh, Bacon, who championed the idea of experimental science. And he had all of these really incredibly strange things to say about the role of science, about how it would make us the master and possessors of nature and how we can torture the secrets out of nature. It's really, he uses all of this unbelievable language. But one of the aspects of his thought is that um, through the through science as a joint human enterprise, uh, we will be able to collectively uh, combine all of our knowledge and all of our investigations and uh, subjugate nature. Uh, he actually used the phrase, make nature the slave of mankind. And the whole thing that he's getting at is that um, we'll be able to, through the use of applied uh, science, which we would now call technology, we'll be able to create heaven on earth. And it's a very, very linear view of time. So he, he, he very clearly articulates the scientific myth of progress. And it's really only in the Judeo-Christian tradition that you have this, this linear view of time. Because if you go back to the Greeks, their view was basically, you know, cyclical. Time was cyclical. And you find that in a lot of other cultures as well. But it was from this Judeo-Christian view of time that, uh, you know, at the very end of time, there's going to be, what, some kind of uh, apocalypse or paradise or heaven or whatever. And, and what Bacon did was he took this idea and, and he expressed it in a secular way that, 
we could turn the earth into some kind of uh, utopia through technology. And you can see how successful it was in a sense. We've uh, developed all of this technological power and uh, we've used it to basically pave over the entire planet. So it was a very powerful myth. It's a myth that, that, that is still, um, you know, determining the way that people think about things. You mentioned the, uh, you know, the Christian idea of the uh, apocalypse and rapture or whatever. I mean, that's been very important in influencing um, attitudes, even amongst people who wouldn't call themselves Christians. You know, the idea that, that humans have dominion over the earth. And as mentioned earlier, you know, that they're there yes. to be exploited and, and the things that Francis Bacon said. I mean, I've not really read much of his material, but even the quotes that you have in your book, it's, um, it's horrific. Uh, language it really is it's sort of like um it doesn't even sound like a capitalist exploiter it sounds it's, <laughs> it sounds more like a bond villain or some sort of maniac you know who wants to who actually wants to destroy the earth um it's extraordinary language yes well he was um he was actually the inquisitor uh in the witch trials at the time and what he did was he he borrowed the language um from the witch trials in terms of like torturing women and apply that to the experimental method. So that's actually where all of that strange language comes from. And then of course there was the philosophy of, if you can call it that <clears throat> utilitarianism. And yeah, uh, yes. that's an important part to play in all of this. For me personally, when I reread again in your book, just setting out what this is, I thought, yeah, this is just the death of the present moment. Basically it's everything being put off for some future time. Yes. And uh, it's it was a very strange philosophy to me. In some ways, it seemed to be saying, this is what it is, but in order to go about it, you won't get what we're saying you're going to get. So strange, sort of circular. Yes. Well, uh, the idea behind utilitarianism is that uh, uh, nothing has any value in itself. It doesn't have any uh, intrinsic value. It only has value if it's turned into something else, which basically means uh, transforming it into something else and being able to sell it. So the real value of, of anything is uh, financial. And so uh, people who are under the spell of this utilitarian philosophy, for example, would look at a forest and uh, they might not realize that, oh, this is an incredible living organism and it's beautiful and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they look at it and, and start wondering, well, uh, actually, this doesn't have any value at all, but uh, if I could convert it into, you know, boxes of boards or pencils, then it would finally have have some value. And there's a whole chapter in the book uh, devoted to the emergence of these utilitarian ideas. It's pretty well documented, and it's, it's pretty scary because, um, uh, again, uh, those utilitarian ideas uh, still strongly... Uh, you know, shape our modern uh, worldview. And that's that's why there are a lot of people uh, in the United States where I'm from who uh, always have to stay active at all times. They, you know, there's this cult of, of busyness because the present moment doesn't really possess any value. They're always looking to uh, work and transform the present into some other future state that finally will possess value. Well, of course, the present moment is all we have. Yes. When you think about <laughs> it. Um, but you know that saying that the best things in life aren't things, what happens to to love or creativity or art or, uh, you know, sitting in that forest that you mentioned and just benefiting from being in that space? What happens to that under the, the yoke of utilitarianism? Yeah. Well, it... Uh... It, it marginalizes basically all human experience and it reduces everything to a financial equation. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, uh, so again, to go back to what you were saying, ultimately it, it, re it results in the sense of alienation because all of those, you know, other things, the experience of beauty, the experience of life, love, creativity, th th those are all parts of our intrinsic nature that uh, really make us uh, feel human, you know, that that's what makes us human beings. And uh, this utilitarian view is also, uh, it's a direct uh, consequence of the mechanistic worldview, but it, it makes us think, uh, 
it makes us think uh, purely in terms of instrumental reason. Uh, and th there are many ways in which we can know and relate to the world. But uh, when we look at the world instrumentally, we're always asking, uh, how can I turn this into something better for me? Uh, but not in a deep sense, in a, you know, in a financial sense, really. Well, yeah. And as you say, that brings us to where we are right now, which is grinding through the Earth's resources as quickly as possible, uh, because that's what this economic model demands. And, uh, lots and lots of people, millions of people who can't feed themselves and, you know, don't have anywhere to live and haven't got, haven't got any work. And millions of other people doing something that's absolutely meaningless. In fact, it's contributing to the problem in order that they justify their existence in economic terms. You know, I mean, when it comes down to it, people have things that they, that catch their interest, you know, passions, things they believe in, things that they could do that would be meaningful. But beyond all that, I mean, who the hell wants a job? Nobody wants a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, when it comes down to it. So, and the number of, jobs that we could actually wipe out if you, you know if everyone looked at what they were doing and said is this necessary is it actually useful uh, or is it contributing to a problem which in, then needs to be cleaned up by somebody else doing another job that didn't previously exist on and on and on yes yes uh, there's a famous uh, quotation from buckminster fuller where he says that we have you know the technology to supply everyone on the planet with some kind of you know, livelihood. And, uh, there, there's quite a, uh, difference between having a job and having a work, which is something that you believe in and engages you at some, some deeper level. And again, uh, this whole idea of, um, con contemporary employment, uh, I mean, obviously we, we need a new economic, uh, model because it's a scientific fact that, uh, you can't continually uh, I expand in a closed system of natural resources. It's just physically impossible. Uh, but one of the uh, another uh, another consequence of the mechanistic worldview is that it actually uh, t turned workers into machines as well, so that they were sort of like cogs in you know a factory machine. If you ever saw the film. Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. That's kind of a funny takeoff on that idea. And so, uh, workers become sort of like these replaceable cogs. And, uh, it doesn't really, uh, do very much to enhance, uh, human dignity or help people, uh, realize themselves as, as human beings in some deeper sense. You also talk in the book, um, about the role of myth in forming worldview and this is very important to think because these days people think of myths as just you know, legends from from ancient times that didn't have any substance to them. It was just primitive people's way to try and understand the reality. But the meaning of myth has actually changed somewhat over the years in people's minds. And it didn't always mean something that was exclusively invented and had no basis in reality. But whatever the spectrum of story that could come under the banner of myth... Uh, you point out that we are laboring under modern myths. You know, the role of myth is something that's as relevant in our lives and worldview as it ever was. It's just that we don't, our understanding of it has changed. Yes. And I think that, you know, it's something that most people are unconscious of as well, because again, myth is really part of a uh, worldview and most people just aren't conscious of their worldviews because they're too close to it. But <clears throat> really, uh, the way that I look at myth is that myth is a kind of story, uh, a kind of story, uh, uh, a symbolic story that catalyzes human action. And so uh, it's basically a narrative that people live by, and everyone lives by a narrative or narratives. So we're all, uh, all of our lives are informed by myths and narratives and things like that. And all of the greatest things that happened in history would have never happened if you know, there weren't guiding myths behind them. But I think that uh, at least some people are, uh, you know, at the stage now where uh, we're beginning to realize that uh, we're not just a product of myths, we create them as well. And uh, and in, in some way, we're a product of our worldviews. But then 
uh, we also create the worldview. So it's a, a circular or, or spiral structure. And so if we become aware of the myths and the worldviews uh, that are, are dominant in our culture, we can also change those by becoming aware of them as opposed to just being uh, unconscious of them and, and living them out without any sort of self-reflection. It's clear that uh, we lose something as we grow up from childhood to adulthood that affects our relationship with everything we're talking about, you know, the rest of nature and wider reality. I don't know if you ever read any work by Joseph Chilton Pierce. He's the crack in the cosmic egg guy. Yes. But I did an interview with him not that long ago, and because uh, he just reissued one of his old books that was out of print. And he stresses this idea that children have this intimate connection with all else that is that gradually they lose. And one of the main reasons that they lose it is because it's pushed out of them by the predominant culture. Yes. And that sounds bad enough, but worse still is that the reason this is happening is essentially because our culture at a macro level is insane. And if it had too many people, whether it was kids or young adults or whatever, reflecting this back on itself, that would be an impossible situation. So young people growing up must be assimilated into the system so they don't see it for what it is, as insane. And obviously not every not everyone's trapped in the matrix. Some people are just going, hey, maybe this isn't such a good idea. That's this is acculturation, he calls it. And I think you touch upon this in the book that, you know, we do lose something of that really important, vital, intimate connection as we move from childhood to adulthood. Yes, yes, um, I think that's true. And in terms of uh, the socialization process, uh, I'm, I'm a huge uh, advocate, by the way, for uh, the humanities. And, uh, you know, I have a background in philosophy. And so, you know, the Socratic idea that the self examine life is not worth living and learning is inquiry, all of those things. And then you look at our educational system, you know, even at, you know, the college level and, uh, the whole point of it should be to encourage people how to think. And I remember actually once when I was a philosophy professor that one of the senior members in the department took me into his office. And this is someone who had a, a PhD from Harvard and studied under Paul Tillich, he said to me, you know, David, I've been teaching for 30 years and the only time that I've ever run into problems with students is when I've asked them to think for themselves, which I was <laughs> absolutely shocked by my job. I couldn't believe that someone in the field of philosophy would say something like that. But it is true, I think, because, um, for example, the educational system is uh, pretty much geared to uh, creating good employees and corporations, for example, they do want some people to think, uh, you know, maybe at the top, uh, you know, one to 2% of, you know, the corporate hierarchy. But then in terms of, you know, the people below them thinking they really just want them to do what they're supposed to do, I suppose. But um, to uh, also amplify what you said uh, from Joseph, Chilton Pierce, I remember something that Robert Bly once said that made an impact on me. And uh, my wife and I actually have an 18-month-year-old baby, and uh, I've never had a child before. It's just amazing to be around him and all of his energy. And, you know, he's engaged with everything and curious, and he has this innate intelligence. It's really miraculous. But I remember um, one thing that Robert Bly once said, and he said that when we're little children, uh, our personality is like a 360 degree circle and slowly as we grow older, we learn to take part of that circle and put it in a bag. And that by the time we've graduated from college, we've put like 90% of our personality in the bag and then it takes the rest of our lives to take it out again and become whole people again. <laughs> so mm. it's a nice image, I think. Yeah, it is. It's a, that's a great visual image to, to, <laughs> to play with in the mind. The rationality and the reason, the logic that was so important in the scientific age, uh, for obvious reasons, that would have been acknowledged by people in the past as having limits. Uh, you know, mentioned the way, like, for example, some of the Greek thinkers went about their analysis of reality. And it's becoming increasingly clear now that there are limits to these ways of 
the modalities of thinking for very good reasons. So there's there's more than one type of intelligence. Yes, yes. and uh, I think that again that comes out in your your work as as a as a, a key thought. Uh, yes, um, you know I mentioned that as kind of an aside at certain points uh, throughout the book. And for example, uh, for for Plato, human beings have a lot of different kinds of intelligence, and um, uh, Plato never doubted the importance of. Uh, rationality or or logic, but for him it was always a tool that would allow us to sort of like purify the mind so that we could see reality in a deeper sense uh, without that kind of uh, separation that is characteristic of logic and thinking in, in deductive ways. And if you look at the philosophy of, of science, um, you know, it, it's very interesting uh, uh I mean, science is really, you know, miraculous. I mean, how, you know, uh, th- there must be some very, very deep bond between our intelligence and the patterns of, of nature that allow us to formulate these sort of like kind of scientific laws. And, and so, so I don't think Newton was actually entirely wrong when he said, Oh God, I think my thoughts after the, uh, in order to do science and arrive at the kinds of uh, incredible insights, you know, that we have over the course of centuries. There is something, uh, amazing about the human mind that shows how, uh, intimately well fitted it is to the deep structure of reality. But then on the other hand, um, s- science also does not show us reality as it is. It only shows us reality as, um, ex- as it's exposed to our method of questioning. And, uh, one of the things that we've realized from the study of, of science, uh, which is a little disconcerting maybe is that, um, you can have scientific models that work perfectly in terms of, uh, you know, predicting phenomena and things like that. Uh, but the models themselves do not actually correspond to reality in a one to one way. And so, this is actually one of the sources, I think, of, you know, sort of like our postmodern predicament and sort of like postmodern philosophies is this realization that, that there's an as- aspect to science which is just purely instrumental. And we can never be sure whether the scientific models are, are corresponding to reality in a deep sense or whether they're just, uh, you know, working as functional tools. Considering some of the the most profound and important scientific discoveries. We talk about the the limits of rationality, reason, and logic, and what have you. I mean, a lot of these scientific discoveries were the result of uh, intuition and inspiration. You know, that comes from yes. who, from from, yes. who, from who knows where, whether acknowledged by the people in question or not. I mean, someone like Einstein, for example, was very open about his ideas coming from somewhere else. Yes, and that that's not a that in itself as a, as a thought isn't exactly quote unquote scientific. You know, you just sit down and boom, there your theory of everything just pops into your head. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, that uh, creative process is very, very interesting. And again, that really shows, uh, you know, the limitations of logic. Because, uh, for example, with deductive logic, uh, the problem with deductive logic is that it never produces anything new. And, uh, you start with your premises and then you go through reasoning and you arrive at the conclusions. But everything that you find in the conclusions is already in the premises. And so that raises the question, how, how is it that we actually arrive at these new scientific, uh, insights about the world? And, uh, there was an American philosopher, uh, Charles Pierce, who introduced a third category of logic, which he called abductive logic which is the logic of creative problem solving. And he basically said that, you know, scientists come up with a creative flash and then they, they test it to see, you know, whether it works or not. Uh, but it, it's, but, you know, these great scientific discoveries, they're not arrived at through deductive logic uh, because deductive logic just doesn't produce anything new. And that, that also relates to the universe itself, which, which shows, you know, that the mechanistic worldview is, is false because if you have a machine, <clears throat> if you have something that's functioning as a machine, uh, 
it never produces novelty, but we can look back at the history of, you know, the universe, which what reaches back, you know, like 15 billion years or something like that. And at, at, you know, over this vast, you know, you know, period of deep time, you have the emergence of all of these new structures and things like that. Uh, and what, what scientists realize now is that the universe is unfolding and creative and that the future states of the universe cannot be predicted in advance. Uh, so, uh, if the universe operated as a machine, uh, uh, th- that would not actually be the reality of, of the situation. In fact, what happened is that the Newtonian universe was, uh, incredibly, it was, it was a totally mechanistic view of the universe. And there was a French scientist, uh, Simone Laplace. And Laplace said that if you had a, uh, he didn't use the term supercomputer, but if we'll use that just because that's the way we would say it now. But if you, if you had a, a powerful enough supercomputer that knew the position and mass, uh, of, and, uh, um, motion of every particle in the universe, then you would be able to predict the future state of the universe. And we know from our more modern, you know, scientific understandings that that just is not possible. Another important idea, I think, extending from the idea of limits to thinking is limits to uh, language and also the written word, because the language tends to be how we think. Yes. And, you know, because when you have it to- tossing something around in your mind, I don't know about you, but I'll quite often hear my own voice, random sentences, just trying to work through some thought or idea. And if you think in terms of language, that in itself is, is, is limiting. If you think about it as well in an Orwellian sense, depending on what concepts and what ideas and literally what words people have at their disposal will affect how they think and what conclusions they come to. And we also live in a time where this is just a little side point of mind a little pet peeve where in some spheres the language seems to be narrowing yes in the sense that the number of words that people actually know <laughs> and <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just thinking about technological phenomena like text speak um yeah. and you know people abandoning punctuation altogether now but that, that's part of it yes it's it's it, that's a very interesting phenomenon and um one of the things that's strange is that uh you know we have this idea that all aspects of human culture are evolutionary in some sense. But if you actually go back and look at the history of uh, Indo-European languages, uh, what you'll discover is that the languages were much more complex in the past and that over time they've become simpler and simpler. It's a really strange phenomenon. For example, the uh, classical kind of Greek that was spoken in Athens, you know, the kind that Plato wrote, is, is much more complex than, uh, you know, the Greek that's spoken today. And there are all sorts of, uh, you know, grammatical forms that over time have just, you know, fallen out of usage. And, uh, it is, it is an interesting thought because, um, you know, it, 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 it if you, you know, because, uh, for example, if, if you read a lot of spiritual literature, people are always talking about the evolution of consciousness and, and things like that. But, uh, I see a lot of evidence that, uh, you know, suggests the opposite, really, and that certainly uh, we live in a time when there's been an evolution of technology, which has been un- unprecedented, but are, are, are people themselves really evolving in terms of their consciousness and their, their abilities to uh, understand the world in, in deeper ways? And I, I find that to be uh, a fairly questionable idea because and I, and I think that a lot of the technologies that we're now using like social media and things like that really have the effect of dumbing people down and simplifying thought yeah i mean i think i spent a long time when i started reading about these sorts of things you know nature of consciousness and uh and evolution and and origin of life and all, the, all these big questions which were even back in the in the 1980s that it did seem to be that there was some kind of positive evolution occurring under under great duress, but that's quite often how evolution happens, mm-hmm. you know, under stress. Yes. But I do I, I do have to sort of reluctantly agree with your point that I'm not sure if that is if that hasn't stalled, if not gone into reverse. And I, I've characterised it this way before: is that I, I see people going almost like in two different directions, 
And again, this is due to a lot of the pressures that we've created for ourselves on the planet, is that there are people who are desperately trying to advance their way of thinking, understanding, yes, and devoting a lot of time to that. And I see a lot of other people kind of slipping into unconsciousness as a response, as I say, to, to pressure. And uh, whatever it might be, just, I mean, there's plenty for them to do. There's never been more plastic junk to buy, never been more <laughs> computer games to play and movies to watch and mindless things to lose yourself in. So I, I kind of see it as a, a, a divergence. And that's a big generalization, but that's that's the only way I can really explain it. Yeah. Well, I think there, there's a lot of uh, evidence to support that in a, in a sense, because, uh, for example, I've worked in uh, book publishing all of, all of my life and uh, I go back and look at the books that were published in the United States, say like by Harper and Rowe, say like in the 1960s, and they had all of these, you know, in- incredibly, you know, intellectually deep books that now if they're still in print, they're published only by university presses. And you go into bookstores today and, you know, they have all of these new categories like how to uh, overcome household clutter and things like that. So you have a hundred books on how to deal with clutter in your life. So... Uh, you know, in terms of uh, what's being published and in terms of what's coming out of the academic world, uh, it, it does seem like we've stalled out a, a bit. And, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, is a very, it is a very interesting question. It could, it could be that, you know, culture moves in waves. But, you know, right, right at the moment, uh, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence to suggest that, uh, we're experiencing a great leap in the evolution of consciousness at the present time. I don't really think that's true. There's another little point in your book, which a lot of implications flow from. And that's when, in terms of human thinking and understanding, a shift occurred from why to how. And I think that that's really, really important because one of the things that you can think of that in scientific terms, you know, science wants to know how this is, not necessarily why, but yes. what's interesting for me as a lay person and most other quote unquote ordinary people, the why is the most important. And when you read popular science books that are aimed at the public, they talk about implications. That's what people want to know about. Okay. If that's so, okay. Yeah. That happens. That's how it's done. But what does this mean? Yes. Whereas yes. A, a lot of science is like, Oh, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. Or if it does, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I think that one of the things that that's happened, I, I think that people are hungry for that. Uh, you know, they want to understand why, uh, you know, as Socrates said, uh, wonder is the beginning of philosophy. And so I, I think that uh, human beings do have this uh, essential desire to understand the world in some deep way. And that at, at nature, at, at, you know, the heart of our nature, we really are curious uh, and we want to understand things deeply. Uh, but one thing I've been thinking a lot about recently because I'm uh, helping to organize this little uh, conference on the humanities is that there's there's been a shift in the academic world, at least, uh, to uh, learning just about things rather than learning, you know, from things. And so, uh, you know, some, something actually quite negative has, has happened. And I think this is part of the consequences of, you know, the postmodern impulse where, you know, uh, everything has become just a perspective. It's like Nietzsche said, you know, there are no truths, only perspectives. And so uh, in the past, when people would study, you know, thinkers of the past, they would, their primary uh, interest would be, you know, what can I learn from this thinker or what can I learn, you know, from this person? And, and, and now it's just learning about things. And I think that's one of the things that probably makes the educational system, uh, you know, uh, have an unsatisfactory uh, feeling to it because, as you say, people really do want to understand why. You also talk in the book about development of psychoanalysis and what that began to suggest about our nature. You talk about, I mean, Freud, I think, was a deeply flawed sort of character I just can't relate to at all. But <laughs> nevertheless, he, you know, he, he gave us some uh, the building blocks of some important insights, which were picked up by Jung, who somebody actually says material makes a lot more sense to me. But notions of um, a subconscious or a collective unconscious, the idea that there's something beyond us, below, beyond, above, whatever you want to call it, was kind of the beginning of the end for the materialistic worldview in some ways. Although we've had 
a hundred years of quantum mechanics, which have been telling us all sorts of other things about you know the intimate interconnectedness of everything, that's been quite slow to be assimilated in in teaching and in mainstream society. Mm-hmm. Again, the, it's, it's been about how, not so much well, what is, what does this potentially mean? Right. But as cutting edge science and people working, in, you know, beyond the mainstream, their work is revealing patterns in nature and a tendency towards order, an appearance of uh, intelligence inherent, you know, in everything in the entire universe. That's what a lot is being revealed and suggesting that, despite the the turmoil that we currently find ourselves in, in all sorts of ways that. And the aforementioned kind of stalling of any development of human consciousness is that we are moving in a direction that's away from this, ultimately away from this rut that we've been stuck in for some time. Yes, uh, I, I think that's true. And uh, one of the things that I tried to do in this book is show how, in terms of modern scientific discoveries, that this idea of nature's intelligence is uh, coming back. And in terms of the origins of psychology, um, you know, th- that's very interesting because the romantic philosophers who rebelled against the mechanistic worldview were really the first individuals to uh, introduce this idea of the unconscious. Well, actually, it goes back even further than that, but it, it was a central part of their thinking. And what happened is that Descartes had reduced the human personality to basically being nothing more than a rational ego and spectator that was totally disconnected from the world. And so, and so it seems that this whole idea of the unconscious arose almost as a compensation, uh, to that, uh, you know, to show the world that, you know, there are deeper levels of, uh, the personality and, uh, the unconscious is one of, of the ways that we relate at a deep level uh, within our own structure, you know, to nature's, uh, intelligence. Uh, so, uh, all human, uh, or rather all organisms, uh, you know, are intelligent, uh, by nature. Uh, there was an ancient Greek philosopher who said that, you know, everything that is alive is intelligent. And a lot of this, uh, guiding intelligence, uh, you know, is actually unconscious. For example, uh, our metabolism and our breathing and our heart rate and, you know, things like that are all, you know, automatically controlled by our body's, you know, intelligence, which, uh, thank God is unconscious because if we had to, uh, you know, listen to all of these instructions going out, it would drive us, it would drive us insane. But, uh, you know, when we cut our hand, uh, the hand heals. And if you take a flatworm and you cut off the flatworm's head and tail, it will actually grow a new head and a new tail. So nature has these, uh, you know, incredibly intelligent regenerative powers built into it. And that's what I really discuss at the end of the book, um, is how we're becoming more and more aware of nature's intelligence and how people in different scientific fields are actually trying to learn from nature's intelligence again. And uh, the argument that I make is that really, if we're going to have a flourishing future, you know, uh, both for life on the planet and and human beings, that we need to recognize nature's intelligence and learn to uh, collaborate with it in creative ways. Uh, Because the only way that we can, uh, you know, restore the health of the world's ecosystems is by uh, drawing upon nature's own intelligence. It's like if you have a sick patient in the hospital, you know, the doctors can do so much, you know, in terms of, you know, helping the organism uh, along, but basically all healing takes place from within the organism itself. This reminded me of, I don't know if you've ever read Gunter Pauli's uh, Blue Economy book that came out back in 96, something like that. It was quite ahead of its time, I think, but it was very much about imitating nature. It's kind of like it was one of those duh moments, like, of course, you know, but mm-hmm. it's not what we've been doing. But yeah, learning from nature and imitating natural systems, uh, again, yes. in the way that, um, you know, traditional societies would have done for a long time, um, being, being integrated there and, and rather than sort of saying, well, nature's been doing this perfectly well for, 60 million billion squillion years but we've got a better idea you know <laughs> yes 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 well that's um i i uh, unfortunately i didn't read that book but that is uh, one of the key ideas behind the new uh science and idea of biomimicry which is that uh if we look around ourselves 
uh, we discover that the organisms on the Earth embody, you know, 3.8 billion years of evolutionary intelligence and that the organisms around us have, you know, discovered over that period of time how to uh, do things in, you know, really remarkable ways without, you know, polluting the Earth and destroying the environment, but actually, uh, you know, regenerating, you know, the, the world. And, uh, for example, uh, so, so what's happening in, in this field is that, uh, people are looking at the design strategies that, that natural organisms have evolved and using those design strategies as, uh, the basis for, uh, you know, uh, human inventions. And, uh, there, there are many, many examples of this. There's a good book, uh, about biomimicry that's available, but, but one that I'll mention is just, uh, our use of photovoltaic cells um that we use to turn sunlight directly into electricity well the photovoltaic cells that we have now um you know they're expensive and uh there are a lot of toxic substances used in their their construction and uh at, at best i think they're now like about 40% uh 40% efficient in terms of turning sunlight into electricity but this is a, a, a natural property that the plants, uh, you know, developed built billions of, of years ago through photosynthesis, turning sunlight into another form of energy that they store and use. And by contrast to photovoltaic cells, plants are like 90 or 92 percent efficient in terms of turning uh, sunlight into into energy. And so what people in biomimicry are doing is they're looking at how plants do this because if somehow we could replicate this, uh, you know, remarkable, you know, technology of nature, uh, uh, you know, it, it would help us in terms of, you know, meeting our energy needs and, and things like that. So if we look at, if we look at the organisms in nature, uh, um, most of them are, uh, you know, far more advanced, uh, in, in, in terms of their design intelligence than anything that we've, you know, been able to create in our, you know, laboratories. So as we've been saying, we've been operating with a sense of separateness and isolation uh, from nature, which has been subjugated, exploited. And, you know, as it brings us to where we are now, um, a time of you know, sort of multiple crises on, on many fronts. How much longer we can continue without really comprehensively addressing some of these issues remains to be seen. I, I look at this stuff a lot. It could be your life and my life could end with things being pretty much exactly the same as they are now. In fact, I kind of expect that. Or there could be sudden cataclysmic change in one or more systems. Again, who mm -hmm. knows? It could be a couple of hundred years. It's, it's difficult to call, despite a lot of people analysing this. But I think that however long it takes for us to achieve some sort of fundamental positive change, even if that's forced upon us, you know, by nature, the unlimited growth model that we alluded to earlier is being revealed as not fit for purpose. Uh, yes. Whether it's in terms of consuming the resources in the earth or whether it's in terms of how much junk people can afford to buy, being forced to confront some of these issues now. And of course, as is our tendency, unfortunately, in our age, at least, we do things in the teeth of enormous resistance rather than trying to go the path of least resistance. And I think we'll continue to do that. But the bottom line is, we're being forced to look in the mirror now. We're coming up against some hard limits that no matter what our politicians do and how much money they print, they're not going to be able to work around. We're going to have <laughs> one way or another, we're going to have to face some of these issues. Yes. Uh, well, when I was uh, working on the book, um, I wanted to take uh, a look at some very reliable uh, ecological statistics, you know, to really see what sort of the state of the planet was like. And so I, you know, use very, uh, reliable sources like, you know, uh, government agencies and, you know, NGOs and things like that. And there's a, a small list of things in the final chapter of the book. But there was one statistic that actually appeared uh, after I sent the manuscript to the publisher, which I think was actually the most profound, you know, indicator of, of them all. And that was published just a few months ago. But it, what it, what it shows is that over the past 40 years, human population on the earth has doubled and uh, the number of wild animals, basically all wildlife uh, has decreased by 50%, which is just, you know, an astonishing, you know, figure, you know, like the number of 
you know, creatures in the wild has decreased by 50% because of, you know, basically human activity, you know, the destruction of ecosystems and, and things like that. So people can argue about global warming and things like that until they're blue in the face. But if you look at just this one indicator, it really does show that, uh, we are standing at a, a point where there are very, very profound changes, you know, taking place to the planet. And the thing that I really argue for in, in the final chapter of the book is that, uh, we have to get away from this idea that we're the, the lords and, you know, possessors of nature. And also that somehow we're magically going to fix everything through technology. I don't think that's, that's going to happen, but we need to, Think of human beings, uh, once again, as um, being collaborators in a, in a great work in, in terms of uh, participating in, in nature's own creativity and working with uh, nature's intelligence to bring a, a better world into fruition. And uh, this idea of learning from nature is very, very ancient, you know, it goes back to the beginning of history. But there's also this tradition in the Western world of working with nature to create a better and more beautiful world. And uh, that actually goes back to alchemy and the hermetic tradition as well. And in, in the Renaissance, uh, there were quite a few philosophers who were inspired by this idea that humanity's purpose was to uh, learn from the intelligence of nature so that we could collaborate with uh, nature's creative process and bring the world to fruition. And, uh, I think that this is really, uh, a way forward in a sense for human beings. And in the final chapter of the book, I, I discussed the work of, uh, John Todd as a case history who he's a very famous, uh, ecological designer. And, uh, he worked with a group called the new alchemy Institute and, uh, they invented something called a bio shelter, which, is basically like a solar greenhouse. And then within the greenhouse, there are these translucent tanks that hold fish and algae. And then there's a marsh area and uh, a pond area. And what he discovered is that each one of these ecologies possesses its own kind of intelligence. And when you connect the three areas together and get water flowing between them, that there's a meta intelligence that forms. And uh, these uh, biotechnologies can be used to create food, to purify human, uh, waste into, you know, clear water. Uh, they've done quite a few, uh, experiments with these where, uh, you can transform human sewage into clear water that's, that's five times, uh, more pure than that's, than what is produced by chemical waste treatment plants. But one of the most amazing, uh, experiments that they performed just quite some time ago is there was a very heavily uh, polluted uh, toxic waste site uh, that was like a, a, a witch's brew of toxic chemicals. And so they created one of these living machines uh, with these different ecosystems and they, they slowly allowed the toxic sludge to flow through it and it took like 10 days. And the toxic sludge contained uh, 15 uh, uh, carcinogens. And what they discovered is that uh, by the time that this toxic sludge had reached the end of the process, uh, 14 of the 15 carcinogens had been totally uh, destroyed or eliminated, rather. And the, uh, the one remaining carcinogen, uh, had been 99.9% removed. And, uh, in the fish at the end of the system, there, there were no, uh, traces of any, uh, you know, dioxins or toxic chemicals. And so the, the living, the intelligence of the living systems had, had actually removed, uh, all of the uh, incredibly you know, toxic carcinogens from, from the waste. And, uh, the way that this works is that, uh, in these living machines, you have entire, you know, communities of, li- of living organisms and the living organisms are intelligent. So they're able to sense 
the the chemicals in the waste and they produce enzymes uh that break those chemicals down and you know render them into you know non-toxic you know substances if you look at natural systems there is no such thing as waste waste becomes food so they break these toxic chemicals down into something that's you know not you know, not harmful it's actually something beneficial and what john todd concluded is that by using these kinds of uh, living technologies it's actually possible to uh, regenerate uh you know very toxic you know polluted sites that you know if just if, if just left to themselves would take you know uh decades or even centuries uh to you know repair but but using this kind of living technology you can do it in the space of you know like weeks or months yeah i mean absolutely i mean na- nature is resilient it's just that there are limits and uh you know it and what it can cope with the carrying capacity and i think we just pushed way beyond that in many areas talking about again working with nature reminds me of another principle that we may come to reflect on is that in the industrial age we there's been an emphasis on competition rather than cooperation yes now obviously a lot of things get done cooperatively you know like it takes cooperation to build factories and railways and all the rest of it but this the darwinian influence in all of this has resulted in very just some very destructive t- tendencies uh, in our society and I'm, when i say that we need to perhaps get back to more ideas of cooperation rather than competition i'm not talking about you know some sort of socialist utopia yeah, it's, yes. it's just that there are many areas in which people are doubling up on, you know, resource use, doubling up on jobs that they're doing for the sake of competition. Yes. When cooperation would work a lot better. Um, now, of course, cooperation tends to happen these days in areas like the voluntary sector or charities, you know, particularly environmental ones or whatever. And business is still very much dominated by competition. And, you know, I could perhaps understand why it's like, you know, still seen as dog eat dog. If that money doesn't go to us, it goes to somebody else, et cetera, et cetera. And competition in its purest form undoubtedly can have a tendency toward delivering better outcomes, but not universally so by any means. So perhaps that's a, the principle of cooperation based on what you're talking about on natural um, systems and maybe something that we will be able to employ more going forward. Yeah, yes. Um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense uh, economically if people can share things so that uh, if you live on a street, you know, not everyone needs to have the same kind of saw or whatever. You know, people can share cars. I mean, uh, here in Sarajevo, where I live, I have a car and I drive it like once a week to the grocery store. So it's kind of ridiculous, really. Um, and if we look at the natural world, uh, what we see is that cooperation uh, and uh, collaboration is actually uh you know, as important as competition, if not more important. And, and what we, where we see that is in the biological phenomenon of symbiosis. Uh, so that, for example, uh, bees and flowers, you know, over hundreds of thousands of years have co-evolved with one another so that, uh, flowers provide, you know, pollen and food to the bees and the bees in return, uh, provide the pollination for the flower. So it's basically an evolutionary spiral. And, and all of life, uh, all of biological life is, is, is like that. Uh, in fact, the, uh, and, and this was a, a great discovery that Lynn Margulis, who was one of the, um, developers of the Gaia hypothesis, uh, you know, showed through her, re- her work in microbiology. Uh, if you go back and look at the evolution of life, on Earth, it's all driven by symbiosis, and the mitochondria in our own cells were actually separate bacteria that merged with other cells. And if you look at the mitochondria in our cells, they actually have, uh, you know, different strands of DNA than our regular DNA. So the the entire uh, structure of the natural world is based on this idea of symbiosis symbiosis coevolution and community all of life is is a community and uh and somehow over time organisms uh you know discover how to intelligently cooperate with one another uh you mentioned briefly there just the idea of you know not everyone on the same street needs to have the same toolbox you know perhaps we could uh we could do without some of that duplication <laughs> that reminded me of 
uh, bigger ideas uh, put forward by the Venus Project and Zeitgeist Movement. I don't know if you're aware of their work. I have reservations about trying to implement significant change on a huge scale. Uh, quite, mm-hmm. quite simply, I don't think it'll work for all sorts of reasons. But in any case, I'm more in favour of not top-down change because I think if we're waiting for change to come from above us, <laughs> use that in uh, <laughs> the loosest possible terms, we're going to be waiting a long time. Exactly. So exactly. I think, you know, ground up small scale, uh, programs, whatever it happens to be, whatever you can do, wherever you are with whatever you've got, you know, don't wait for orders from headquarters. And there'll be changes we can make on our individual lives, which some people are tempted to say, oh, well, that's insignificant, but it really isn't. If we still end up tipping into ecological disaster, well, too bad. But if everyone just says, well, I'm not going to do it till someone else does, then we're not, we're never going to move forward. I'm reminded of, back in the 1980s when they began to introduce unleaded petrol, unleaded gas here in the UK. Mm-hmm. And the initial attitude was uh, people moving over from, from leaded petrol was like, oh, I'm not going to do it. You know, no, I'm not going to be the first to do this. You know, And then I, within five years, it had almost completely changed. Yes. Uh, well, that, that's very interesting. And um, I, I agree with you that, uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, top-down change is... Um, <clears throat> problematic. So, uh, if we, if we look at the natural world in terms of organisms, uh, there is top-down ca- causation that, that occurs because that's what makes an organism an organism. But there's also, uh, bottom-up causation where the parts, uh, create change and contribute to the organism as well. So it's probably, uh, it's, it's a two-way process. Uh, our, our governments obviously, uh, haven't been, uh, you know, great paradigms of intelligent top-down change. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like you say, it's sort of hard to hold your breath. So, so I really agree with you about that. And, um, you know, earlier we, we were talking about how it seems that really consciousness, uh, in some ways doesn't seem to be evolving, but, um, I always like to look at the other side of things too. And, uh, if we go back and look at a lot of the social problems that we've had in the past, for example, look at women's rights, look at racism and things like that. There have been a lot of changes over, uh, the decade, over the decades. And sometimes those changes happen, happen quickly. Uh, so I think that's something that, uh, you know, can give us hope. And, uh, for me, the important thing is finding a way to live with integrity. And some days I, I look at all, all of the statistics and things like that. And I, and I, I genuinely feel, you know, uh, we're living in a hopeless, uh, situation. But even if we are, I have a moral responsibility as a human being to do what I can to, you know, create a better world. And, uh, even if, we're creating a hell of our own making in some ways. Uh, we're still fortunate to live at a point in time where we can experience a sense of uh, paradise, you know, which still exists in the natural world. It's still, it's still there. And we have those moments of, of human beings where we can feel that we're part of the larger reality that goes beyond us. And I, I think that that sense of the sacred is something, you know, extremely important because if we don't have a sense of belonging to a larger reality that goes beyond us as individuals, being part of the fabric of, of all of life and, you know, the cosmos and things like that, uh, without that sense, there's no motivation to act in an ethical way if you're just an isolated individual. But when you have that sense of belonging to a larger reality, it also inspires a sense of belonging and love. And without that sense of love for the world, we're not going to do anything to change it. If it's just a utilitarian duty of ours, in a sense, it's always, uh, it's always uh, possible to produce a much more profound change out of love than it is just out of a sense of duty, I think. Well, just a a sort of whimsical thought to close on, not mentioned in your book whatsoever, but it's something that pops into my head sometimes when I'm considering the big picture. And I've often wondered about whether what we're experiencing at the minute and what has come before and what will lies ahead of us is ever affected by 
some of the bigger cosmic cycles, um, you know, like precession, you know, every 26,000 years. And I'm thinking of the idea of yugas now, you know, periods of time where could mm-hmm. we even, could human consciousness be affected by that or even perhaps by the, the solar system itself as it travels throughout the galaxy, you know, the so-called cosmic year, 250 million years approximately. I don't know, maybe sometimes when I'm looking, you know, when I sort of look at the evening news and then turn it off and disgust and despair and just think, well, as has been seen in the industrial age that we've been living through, we, we can be very narrowly focused, uh, to, you know, depending on what human age we live in, very much about this is all there is. And it's just this little narrow me, 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 my lifetime, maybe the lifetime of a couple of generations before and after. But we're part of something much, much bigger here. And that might not fix our problems today, tomorrow or next year. But I, I often like to think about our journey in those terms. And, uh, you know, there's much more than just what us little cluster of human beings are doing this century. There's way more to it than that. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I think I think that's true. So we need to look at the long term view. And um, uh, we, we do live uh, we do live at a unique point, I think, in Earth's uh, history, uh, you know, and, and they now call it what the, the Anthropocene, because, you know, uh, we, we humans have become a force of change in the natural world that never uh, existed to this extent. I mean, we're right up there with everything else now. So I think that we are at a unique, uh, you know, juncture, but uh, I agree with you that we need to look at the long term. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if we humans can't figure you know, things out in terms of, uh, you know, like, uh, maintaining and restoring the health of the planet. The planet itself will in some ways. So, uh, you know, there's only so much we can do as, as individuals. And in terms of like large time cycles and things like that, I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, but I did study the work of Jung in, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of depth and he does talk about, uh, the changing of the gods that happens at a deep level uh, in the human psyche, and he correlated that with the precession of the equinoxes. And it's it's interesting because you can go back historically and see that when uh, you know you have like those two thousand year cycles, there have been uh, changes that have taken place in the deep psychic dominance of of humanity. So we don't we don't live in a static world, obviously. We live in a in a world where change is constantly uh taking place. So, you know, th- those changes will take place, you know, one way or another. And uh there there will be continuing, you know, changes in, in terms of uh you know our own levels of awareness and the way that we we, we view the world. It's in, it's inevitable. Well, David, today we've been talking about your new book, as I said at the top of the hour, it's entitled Restoring the Soul of the World, Our Living Bond with Nature's Intelligence. That's widely available, but um, just share details of your website and anything else you'd like to put out there. Uh, well, I do have a website uh, called The Cosmopolis Project, and it's uh, www.cosmopolisproject.org. And so there are articles and things like that. On that and uh, uh, aside from that, uh, there, there's also a website for the book, which is uh, thesouloftheworld.com, where there are sample chapters and you can read the table of contents. And it's received some very nice endorsements and things like that. So, so I really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, conversation, a real, uh, you know, changing uh, a real exchange of ideas. And uh, so I really appreciate that because oftentimes when you talk about things like this, someone will throw out a question and then you answer and things like that. But I feel that this has really been uh, much more of a uh, you know mutual dialogue, and uh, I think that's the model that we need to you know aim for in all of our communication. So so it's been really great speaking with you. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, once again, thanks for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Okay, thank you very much. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, 
And if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Based on current audience numbers, if everyone who tuned in donated just five pence per show, that's about eight cents US, this could become a full-time, fully funded operation, offering more and more often. During October 2014, over 50,000 of you streamed or downloaded at least one show. Total donations were seven UK pounds, which currently converts to about $11 US. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.